Good morning. I brought my large Bible today. Look very spiritual. Okay. It's Acts 20, 1 through 16. So you can find it with me. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. When he had gone through these regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews, as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Sopater the Berean, son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. These went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day. And he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him, and taking him in his arms said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak and so departed. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. But going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Assos, intending to take Paul aboard there, for so we had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Assos, we took him on board and went to Mytilene. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite Chios. The next day, we touched at Samos. And the day after that, we went to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Thank you. You may be seated. At the door, I had to use it. Just had to test it out. Uh, this morning, we come to um, an interesting passage, and someone already commented of, I had a really late night, late night, and my family and I are super tired, and then I saw that the title of your sermon was Falling Asleep in Church, and I got a little nervous, um, which if that's you, you should be. Um, Ephesians 5, 14 reads this. You don't have to turn there. We're going to be in Acts 20. But it says this, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. When we experience Christ, it awakens something within us. It changes us. And as His light shines upon us, it guides us in the way in which we are to go. And this morning, we step into this passage that has what seems like an odd detail thrown into it, kind of a, not a glamorous story tucked in there in between two what read like itineraries, travel itineraries. We read of, of where Paul is going, and then suddenly we get this story of a young man who falls asleep in church. Uh, and not only does he fall asleep, but he falls out a window to his death. Um, now, as someone who... Uh, teaches and has done this for almost two decades, I, I can tell you, um, I've put people to sleep, okay? I've, I've done it. I've actually, I've put some of you to sleep. Uh, I've, I've seen you. I see you. Uh, and today I'm naming names um, as, as how, how we're going about this. No, but, it, but unintentionally, intentionally, it, it, it happens. I, I, I watch is, is that, that slow Bob, and you know, you, you pretend. I did the same thing as a kid when I was in church, and I would be like this, and my mom's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm praying. I'm praying <laughs> the entire service. I'm praying. Right? But what we see is that this, this young man, Eutychus, he falls asleep in the middle of this moment where Paul is teaching, uh, and he, he falls down to his death, and he's raised again. And so I just want to give warning here. If you are to fall asleep in service, if you are to fall asleep in the balcony and you are to fall to your death, I will not revive you. Okay, so be warned. Okay, stay with me this morning. Be awake. And you who sit in the balcony have warning. 
but this morning, we, we asked this question, why is this passage here? Why is this included? Because so often, I think one of the dangers we have with our modern day hermeneutic, how we interpret the Bible, is we just put ourselves right in the center of the story and we say, what does this mean for us? It's the first place that we go. But really, what we need to do when we approach the, the passages, when we approach scriptures, to say, what was the sender's intended meaning? Meaning, what did the author intend to convey by what they put in place? What was God doing as he guided Luke along in this moment? Pastor Ron and I were having this conversation in the hallway this week about the importance of context and, and looking at what's happening in the passage before just coming to your own conclusions. And so this morning, we're going to look at this in its context and see, okay, why is this included here in this? What is Luke drawing our attention to in the movement of God? And, and then we'll ask the question, what is this showing us about who God is, his character? What's it revealing? And then we'll get to the question of, okay, so what does this mean for us? What do we take from this? Because I believe that in these few verses, uh, there is a reminder to the dangers of falling asleep in church. And that these dangers are, are alive and well today, and we, we do need to pay attention. So turn with me, uh, if you're already there, Acts chapter 20, verse 1 is where we'll be jumping in. And as you're finding your spot there, uh, we're going to notice that this first section of verses that we read, again, is just kind of this travel itinerary of where Paul is going. And if you remember last week where we had left off, Paul had already determined that he was going to make his way through Macedonia to Achaia and eventually to Jerusalem and then on to Rome. That's, that was his trajectory of where he wanted to go. And we saw as there was a bit of an uproar in the midst of Ephesus as Demetrius rallied all the silversmiths because they saw their livelihood going away because of the disruption of the gospel. Because what we discovered last week is that Jesus disrupts everything. And so we pick up in verse uh, 1 of chapter 20. And it says, after the uproar ceased, this was after the conversation in the middle of the theater with Demetrius and all the silversmiths, after the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. And when he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. Now, I'm going to show you this map up here that has probably more information than we need at this point in time, but I think it's helpful for us to know that these are rooted in real places in real times. And so we're beginning today in Ephesus. This is where Paul is taking off from. He's going to make his way up all the way through to Macedonia. He's going to come down into Achaia. Achaia was referred to as Achaia or Greece. It could go by either one. They're often used interchangeably. And we're going to see that eventually Paul is going to make his way back to Corinth, a city that he had spent much time in. And then that little dotted line is going to be his return journey of his plans are going to change. And initially, he's going to want to get to Corinth and then sail all the way to Syria, but that's not going to happen because of some things he discovers along the way. But what I love when we look at these maps is we see that Paul is constantly retracing his steps. And why is he doing that? Because Paul is an amazing church planter. And not only that, he's just pastoral. He's a shepherd. And so he wants to revisit all the places that he's planted so he can encourage them some more. And so we're told that he eventually makes his way into Achaia, into Greece, where he most likely spent three months. It says in verse 3, three months. And when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. So Paul's in Corinth. He's there encouraging. This is actually the spot and the time frame in which he writes uh, the letter to the Romans that we have in our, our scriptures. And so he, there he is. He's having a fruitful ministry there. His intent was to go back to the church that had sent him, the, the, the church in Antioch in Syria. But as he's getting ready to prepare there, for some, some reason, this, this plot is made known to him that people are out to get him. Paul always has people that are out to get him. He always has people that are trying to, to kill him. We have some Jewish leaders that are plotting against him. And so instead of setting sail, he just hits the road and he walks all the way back through. He takes the long journey home. And we're told in verse 4 that he took Sopater, the Berean, son of uh, Phyrus, accompanied him. And of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Segundus and Gaius of Derby and Timothy and the Asian and Stichicus and Trophimus, and here we're given a list of those who came alongside Paul. Men from Berea, men from Thessalonica, men from Derby, men from Ephesus and Asia. 
This procession of people gives us a glimpse of the churches that they represent in the places that Paul has already been and planted churches. They had come along with him and they were going to be accompanying him back to Jerusalem because if you remember, and we read this throughout Paul's letters, at this time he's been collecting funds to bring back to the Jerusalem church. And what a beautiful picture to see that Paul, everywhere he's planting these churches, he's taking this collection from some of these Gentile churches so that he can come back to the home church in Jerusalem to bless them. And so now he has these men coming along with him, representing these different churches so that they can see the diversity of the body of the church, but the unity of purpose as they come together in this moment hand in hand. And so verse 5 says that they went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas, but we sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. The days of unleavened bread, that would be the Passover feast. And so Paul is celebrating the Passover feast, but he's also celebrating the completion of it in the resurrection of Jesus. And so he'd be celebrating both ways in that case. But there's something within the language that's worth us noticing again here too. Verse 6, it says, but we sailed. Suddenly, the the narrator is back in the picture. It's been third person now. We've got this, that we sailed. He's a part of the action again. We we saw this in, in chapter 16 when Luke, the author of this account, stepped into the scene again. And now he's joined back with them. They've picked him back up in Philippi. And he's joining along. And what we're gonna notice is that the story starts to read like an eyewitness account a little bit more. There's some more detail to what's happening here as he joins again with them. And so they celebrate the the unleavened bread, and in five days they went to Troas, and they stayed there for seven days. Now, verse 7, we read this, on the first day of the week. Now, it doesn't seem like that's of that much importance, but what this is signifying is that this is Sunday. This is the first day of the week, according to the Roman way of keeping town. This is time. This is Sunday. This is the first day of the week. And what we're going to see is that this gathering that Paul has brought together is holding a worship service. They're going to break bread together. They're going to take communion. They're going to remember the Lord's Supper together in this time. They're going to spend time looking at the Word and teaching. And Paul's going to teach all night, we're going to see. But this is an early church service that's taking place on a Sunday. This is the earliest account we have of the church service taking place on Sunday. Sunday. Up until this point, it was always the Sabbath when the gatherings were happening. And now we see this this shift for the first time to Sunday. And why Sunday? Because of the resurrection. It was the, the new beginning. And so here they're gathering, and we have it marked here for the first time. And it says on the first day of the week when we gathered together to break bread, again, breaking bread, that was coming together to have a meal, but a part of that meal would also be taking communion, remembering what the Lord had done for them. And on the first day of the week when we had gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. So Paul knew he was taking off the next day, and he had a whole lot he wanted to say, and he was prolonging his speech until midnight, because we know sometimes pastors just got a lot to say, right? And if they know I've got a limited window, I'm going to take full advantage of that, and, and, and Paul knew that. He loved this church. He loved this gathering. And he he didn't know when he was going to see them again. So he wanted to make sure he could impart as much as he could. Now keep in mind, most of the people that were gathered in this, this moment, in this community, they would have worked all day. So they were tired. They were coming in after a full day. And usually bedtime was soon after sundown because you were getting up with the sun because you wanted to take full advantage of sunlight. And so Paul was going well into midnight. This is way past people's bedtimes. In verse 8, it says, And there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered. And a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. Now, let's be honest. We've all been here before, right? As someone's speaking and and you're just kind of lulling you to sleep and you feel it coming and you're fighting it, but you're like, I just had a long day and I'm tired. And Eutychus, this this young man who most likely was between the ages of 9 to to 14 based on the way he's described, 
He's just trying to keep his eyes open as the lamps are lit all around in this upper story. And it really would have been an apartment building by the language and by the description here. This was, this was more of a, a, not a wealthy area of town, but just a place where people would be packed in. And so it's a full room. And he finds himself at the edge of the room and, and right by the window. And when we think of a window, we think of glass. Don't think of that. Think of just an opening in the wall that led to outside that maybe had a small ledge at the bottom. During wintertime, there'd be some wood shutters that could be closed, but most likely at this point it was open, and so he was free to just kind of totter back and just have nothing there to catch him. And so he sank into a deep sleep as Paul continued to talk still longer, and being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. So this Eutychus, whose name, Eutychus, actually means lucky, or fortunate one, right? I mean, tell me that there's not some humor in the Bible, right? This lucky one is tucked up against the window trying to stay cool as he's overcome by just the weight of the day and the heat of the day. And he, he simply starts to fall into a deep sleep. And even the language says that he was lulled into a sleep, almost carries with it this like hyp hypnosis that he was under. He just couldn't stay awake. Now, I know I've told this story before, but I had a student one time who would fall asleep all the time, and so I just decided one day I was going to make him fall asleep as fast as I could. And I watched as he came in, and he was tired, and so I just talked like this until he was gone, right? And he did. He just, he was, he was gone. And here Paul is, is speaking, and he's, he's passion. He's, he's going for it. He's bringing the word, and still it's not enough to keep this poor Eutychus' eyes open, and he drifts, and he falls asleep. And not only does he fall asleep, but he just falls straight back out the window. And, and if you've ever had that moment where you kind of jar yourself awake, right, where you're, you're doing this, and your head kind of bops up, like I just think of airplanes when you're watching people try to fall asleep. Just going back and forth. Now imagine that the moment you realize you're falling asleep is you are falling out a window, right? You're not going to brace yourself. You're not going to have anything. He falls down, and we are told that he falls to his death. Now some people read this, and they're like, well, maybe he just was, he was badly injured and knocked the wind out of him. He was unconscious. This was maybe something like death. No, the language here is saying that he died. Not that he was unconscious, not that he was just simply injured, not that he was just mostly dead. No, he was dead in this moment. Now, I want you to think about that just for a second. Imagine we're in this space, and as I'm talking, suddenly someone just falls from the balcony right into the middle of the floor. That's going to be a little jarring, right? If I just kept on speaking, you guys would be like, you are heartless, right? And so if someone falls to the ground, what are we going to do? Where's all of our attention suddenly going to be? Whoosh, right on that person. And what we see is that in this moment, Paul, we don't know how long it took him to get down there. He rushes straight down there. Everybody's peering out through the window. They're looking down. They're coming and gathering around, and they can tell that this is not a good situation. What was this beautiful moment as they're gathering with Paul now is turned into a scene of horror. Verse 10, but Paul went down and bent over him, and taking him in his arms said, do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. I love this imagery of Paul coming down and just swooping the boy into his arms. And we're not given all the detail of what happens in this moment, but somehow the Spirit of God is moving through Paul, revives this boy, brings him back to life, and Paul is like, listen, I know you're all worried, but don't be alarmed. His life is, is in him. This moment has echoes of the prophets Elijah and Elisha. You can read their stories in 1 Kings 17 and 2 Kings 4 of how they revived those who, uh, were died, who, who had died. And here Paul is, is echoing this moment. He's, he's bringing life where there was none. As he picks up the boy and says, do not be alarmed. Now some could read this and be like, man, how lucky for that Eutychus that Paul was there, right? But really what we see in this moment is, is how fortunate we are that God chooses to shower us with his grace, that he chooses to step into the mundane moments of life and invade that space. It's not luck, it's not happenstance, it's the movement of God in this moment. 
And God is speaking to his people even through this action. They had come and they had gathered to celebrate just who Jesus was. And now in this moment, they're reminded of the one who has the power of life over death. In verse 11, And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak and so departed. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. So this, this might be my favorite image of the whole thing, okay? So Eutychus falls out the window. Paul scoops him up. He's like, it's okay, everybody. He's alive. God's brought him back to life. And what does Paul do? He goes back up. They break some more bread. They eat. And then he just keeps teaching, right? He's like, preacher's got to preach. I got things to say. Like, let's, let's get going. I don't care what just happened. Like, everyone else would probably be like, man, let's just take a moment to reflect on the, the frailty of life. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. I got things to say. Let's go. And he speaks until daybreak. Like he just keeps going through the night and the people are there with him. In verse 12, and it says that they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. As they walk out of that room, everyone is aware that that Eutychus, that fortunate one, for a moment was dead but now has life because the power of God is real and is active and is alive. And we go from this moment back to the itinerary. But going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Assos, intending to take Paul aboard there. For so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Assos, we took him on board and went to Mytilene. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite Chios. The next day, we touched at Samos. And the day after that, we went to Miletus. And he's just making his way now down the coast, making his way back to Jerusalem. For Paul had decided to set sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. See, Paul had already missed Passover, but he wanted to get there for the next uh, feast. He wanted to get there for the next festival, the next celebration in Jerusalem, and that was Pentecost. And so he's trying to make good time. He wants to get there so that he can come and present this gift to the church at a time when there's all sorts of people around. When the church would be flooded with people and they could see the provision of God and the beauty of his church at work across the globe. And so Paul says, I'm going to just scoot past Ephesus. Now, when we read that, at first we think that seems a little heartless because Paul spent so much time in Ephesus. Why would he skip it? I think it's because Paul was relationally smart. He knew that if he stopped in Ephesus, he was, gonna, he was not going to be able to turn away from the people that he so loved there, that he was going to have to spend time with everybody, and that, that he was probably going to get trapped there for another three to five months because he just wanted to love on everyone. He's like, I got to go. I got to get back to Jerusalem. I'm compelled by the Spirit to keep moving, but we're going to see that he's going to invite the elders of that church to come, and next week, we're going to look at the conversation that they have together. But the question for us is, what do we do with this section, right? This, this strange travelogue that's interrupted by a killer sermon, and, and then there's a, a miracle of life uh, that's found in death, and then in a community that centers around uh, communion time, remembering the work of Christ. Like, all this is going on. Why the inclusion of this? What do, what do we take? What comfort do we have in this? We have to remember, Luke has set out to give us an account. He, he began by giving us an account of the life of Jesus, and he wanted it to be detailed. And he, he's now giving us an account of the movement of God, the Spirit of God moving through his early church to make Jesus known. And so he's including all the details that he can, even some of the ones that we might think, well, let's just get past the story of the kid who fell asleep in church. I don't think everyone needs to know that one. And I'm sure Eutychus is like, yeah, I think we can do without that one. I don't think that's what I need to be the patron saint of is falling asleep in church. Um, but a lot of us are like, thank, thank the Lord for Eutychus because that's my man. But what we see in this moment is that this story that seems so uninspirational reminds us of how God meets us even in our flaws and in our failures. See, Eutychus could be any one of us. I, mean, I remember being at a, a conference. I was, in, I was in college, and for whatever reason, I just remember being in college. I was tired all the time, sleepy all the time. 
But we were at a conference, and it was a men's conference. I was there with my dad. I was there with my brothers, and we had some, some friends that had come with us. And I remember there was this time where it was a breakout session, and we were just sharing prayer requests with each other. And everyone's going through, here's the struggles, here's the challenges I have. And, and we're all sitting in the circle, and I just remember it got to my dad's turn, and he starts sharing what God's speaking to him, and the challenges, and this and that. And, and, and then I just remember my brother nudging me. Because I had fallen asleep while my dad was sharing his prayer requests. Right? Like, what a great kid. Right? My dad's like pouring out his heart, and I'm all, you helped raise me. I can't even give you this. Right? <laughs> And the kindness of my brothers in that moment, and they like nudge me like, why don't you go ahead and pray for dad? I'm like, huh? What? What? But it's not just about our sleepiness, right? It's not just about staying awake in church. That's not really what it's about, right? I know some of you in this room, you are in a season of life where just being here is like a victory, Right? There's so much demanded of you with your kids, with your life, with just the responsibilities on you that you just feel like once I get into the seat, oh, I can relax. I actually had somebody share with me one time, they're like, honestly, church is the one place where I actually get to sit still. So they're like, so, so pastor, if I fall asleep, I'm sorry, but it's the, the only chance I have. Like, and I, and there's like this plea in their voice, and I was like, it's okay, you sleep all you want, you sleep all you want. But, but there's more to this than just our, our sleepiness. Because sleep in Scripture carries more than just the idea of, of resting our eyes. No, sleep, according to, to Mikhail Parsons, a commentator, he, he talks around this idea that it often speaks to a moral laxity, and also a spiritual dullness. Which I think is a greater danger, that we can just start walking through the motions, that we can sleepwalk through life. And here Eutychus is this reminder of where, where we can't, he can. That this kid who falls to his death, he couldn't bring himself back, but the Lord brought him back, chose to act and bring him back. And that the early church, and we get to read and see the tangible presence of God in this moment. But we also know this isn't always the ending. Not everyone gets woken up. But here we see God invading the mundane, the ordinary, the failures and the flaws that we're all susceptible to and bringing about new life. That God has grace even for those who fall asleep in church. Thank the Lord. For his grace is sufficient. And what we see in this passage is we see the continuing movement of God. Even Paul, as he's making his way back and he wants to go back to the church in Syria, God warns him. He gets the information he needs so he doesn't put himself in harm's way so that he can continue to proclaim the goodness of Jesus. But again, we, we start to ask, okay, what's, what's the tangibleness of this for us? See, I, I think there's a warning for us in the danger of falling asleep and the falling asleep in church. Again, sleep in Scripture carries weight. Jesus constantly is calling us to be alert, to be awake, to stay awake. And we have this tendency to just kind of want to sleep and to drift through life because it's hard and it's exhausting. Romans 13, 11 says, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. There's an urgency that comes. And sometimes we want to dull that. We just want to sleep through the hard parts of life. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 through 6. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. When, when Jesus is coming back, you're not in darkness, you're in light. You know it's coming. For you are children of the light, children of the day. We are not of the night or the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. See, I think there's a very real danger for us that we can find ourselves sleepwalking through life. Falling asleep in church is just the warning sign. Jesus watched as his disciples fell asleep as he prayed in the garden, he said, stay with me, stay awake, be watchful. And they couldn't do it. Jesus tells a story in the last days that we are to be on guard, that we are to keep awake. And I think for too many of us, we show up to church just to simply make it through it. 
Okay, I can check that off. I, I did it. I suffered through another sermon. And let me, let me be clear, some of that fault, right, should be aimed at those who are in front. I've, I've had my fair share of very boring sermons. I, I know that. There are times where people are, are teaching the word of God. I've sat under some very boring sermons, and I'm like, you have the living and active word. It's, it's, it's alive, and you are making it very dead, sir, right? It's, we're capable of that. <laughs> I can do that. But there are times we have to push through and we have to remember that it's not just about being entertained. It's not just about, oh, that was a funny story. Sometimes we gather and we just remember what we're looking at, what we're aiming at, and that's Jesus. He's our aim. That's the one we want to look at. And we come in this place and we need to be reminded of that. We need to be remembering our need for each other. When you are not here, we miss out on you. It's not just that you missed church. No, we miss out on you. We miss out on the giftings that you bring to this place. We miss you and what God has designed you for in this place. And so it's not always coming to church because, man, I need to get something out of this, but it's what can I give in the presence of God and in the presence of my brothers and sisters. And we come and we look to him for, for comfort, for exhortation, for strength. But the danger is like Eutychus, we can be lulled to sleep, to the safety and the comfort and even the boring nature of our gatherings at times. I've heard so many people in the last few years that, that keep saying not only has the church fallen asleep, but the church has lost its way, that the church in the West, that the American church is dead. It's just gone. It's, 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 it's over. And this last year, so much has been disrupted for us. And things that we liked were kind of messed with and tweaked with, right? It brought some priorities that bubbled up. We're like, I didn't realize how important that was to me. And maybe that was more important than, than I was actually giving weight to Jesus for. And, and man, it's really messed with us good. And I've watched people grieving the way that church once was. You remember back in the day when, when things were as they should be. See, as I was thinking through this passage, what kept resounding in my head, if I may be so bold, and to look over what so many say is the lifeless corpse of the church, I just want to echo the words of Paul. Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. The church is alive. Because the head of the church is alive. The life and spirit of Christ courses through us. That's the strength. That's the power. Where we are weak, he is strong, and he is still moving still. But for far too long, church has just become an event. And if it doesn't entertain us, if the, the worship set wasn't the right playlist, well, then it's my right to fall asleep. You, you didn't keep me engaged today. That's the consumer mentality that we bring to our places of worship. But let me tell you, if you're starting to feel real cozy, if you feel real safe in church, then let me remind you that death and life hang in the balance. And we should never domesticate the church. The church should be a wild place that it displays God's grace in crazy ways. It is hard to live the way of Jesus in a world that runs so contrary to it. It's hard. It's exhausting. And, and we feel it, right? We feel beat up on every side. But that doesn't mean that we shrink back. We come in here and we lock the doors and we're like, just hang on until it comes. No, that's not the mission that he's given us. He sends us out with courage and conviction, not fear with a love that can overcome even the fiercest of opposition. See, this is a truth that cannot be tamed. So take comfort. Take encouragement. For the church is alive in him. The church is on the move. And for some reason, if you have found yourself lulled to sleep, if you found yourself suddenly complacent, just playing a part. Then may the Spirit of God awaken you.
to the beautiful truth that is meant to be lived this day and every day. Again, not in fear of what may come against us, but in the courage and conviction of what Christ has done. So to all who come as Eutychus today, may the life of Jesus breathe new life into you. May this church and the church awaken to the truth that Jesus is still king and we live for him. And may our lives and our actions, our decisions never become rote as we just play a part or go through motions. But may even the mundane moments of life be awakened to the wonder of a life following Jesus. So to you, I say, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. You Pray with me. Father, as we come before you this morning, I pray for any of the spaces that we have just tried to tame you, to control you, to put a system in place of how church should be. Would you just do away with that and have your way? Would you awaken us again to the joy of following you? Yes, there is trial. Yes, there is hardship. Yes, there is sorrow. There is pain but there is a peace in you that cannot be obtained in any other way. And so, Lord, would we be a place that actively fosters your kingdom, that we live in in opposition to the ways of the world, to the ways of the enemy, God, that we would look different, that our love would seem radical in the way that we pursue you and pursue others. Father, would you awaken our hearts to be as yours? Jesus, we we need your strength, not our own. We need your will to be done, not just more of our willpower. We need you. So God, we ask for you to move. We ask for your spirit to embolden and, and emblaze us as we leave from this place. That in our gatherings, it would be clear why we come together. It's not for our preferences, but it's to make much of you in all things because of what you have done in our lives. That you are the only king. And when we carry that mindset with us wherever we find ourselves, will we not sleep through life? But would you awaken us to your goodness? for your glory. We love you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, in all of our lives, would you be magnified. Where we are weak, would we proclaim your strength? Would we proclaim your glory and your good? Father, would you fix our eyes upon you? Would you awaken us to the reality of who you are? And would we step into that with a fullness of heart to follow you all the days of our life? We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we close this morning, uh, I just want to invite any of you who need prayer, we'll be up here. If you just want to talk about Jesus, if you've got questions and you want to get to know him, if you need a Bible, we've got that. If you're looking for ways to get plugged in, you can go back to the Welcome Center back there and talk with someone there about how you can get plugged into a home group, uh, and serving around here. Again, I know we've got this incredible waterfall that's spilling over here that serves as this reminder of what's about to take place. And I just encourage you, uh, as, as you remember, as you think throughout the week, just be praying for what is going to transpire on this campus. For all the kids that are here, for all the leaders who are here, that God would be magnified in their their lives. But as we step from this place, uh, again, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. May you step into the life. May you awaken to the truth of who Jesus is as you live in his grace and his peace. God bless you. 
We'll see you next week.